Meet Max Chernov. Originally from Russia, he lived in Europe, UK and the US, but chose Singapore for life six years ago. Max shares how much he earns as a professional YouTuber in Singapore, the benefits of raising kids here and what makes him feel like Singapore is his true home. Поехали! So what do you love about Singapore? What's kept you in Singapore for six years? We came to Singapore first, uh, first time in 2014. We spent here half a year with my wife. She was a girlfriend back then, so she did MBA here. Right. And we love the place. It was just super unusual, super unique. Because before I went to Europe, US, Russia, but not really Asia. Asia like a couple of times before, but Singapore was just something like out of this world, like super unique, super modern. Now I appreciate more, I would say, now it's home. The level of people, I think, so there are, you can find any type of people and a lot of successful people and it's, yeah. it's driven because Singapore is very expensive. Yeah. So you cannot live on a budget of like 800 bucks here. So you need to be successful either in your career or in business. So there are a lot of like business oriented people and money driven people. Not always the best thing, but there are like people with the drive and just a, a lot of different, different personalities, nationalities. It is. That, that I enjoy a lot. So as a professional YouTuber, you obviously began your journey in Singapore or you started that prior to Singapore? In Singapore, this channel, yes, I started in Singapore a couple of years ago, but I used to do YouTube for a few years before that in Russian. So I had a YouTube channel about social media marketing. Actually, it was one of the biggest or the biggest in Russian language back then. It still has like 300,000 subscribers. I don't really post there, but that was kind of the base for our business. I had an agency, like social media marketing agency with 45 people at the, at the highest point. So I knew how to, how to do YouTube. I knew how algorithm works. So for, that's, that's why for me it was easier, not easy, but easier to launch like relatively successful channel in Asia because I know how it works. What was, uh, in terms of your life in Singapore, like I said, you've been here for six years, talked about what kind of keeps you here, but what really drives you to get up each day and enjoy Singapore, do different, look at different parts of Singapore, meet more Singaporeans for your channel? What keeps you driven and, and uh, motivated to carry on with what you're doing? On one hand, to invent something new, not to get like bored of what I'm doing. Yeah. Because that's the very easy thing to do. And a lot of YouTubers burn out because of that. Yeah. They're creating content for years and then they're just not motivated anymore. But they're the main role, the main play of this game. So it's very easy. So I'm really careful about what content, what people, what interviews I'm, I'm doing, not to get bored and still like to be excited about the interviews on one hand. On another hand, I know you have to be, I have to be consistent with yeah. what I'm doing. Yeah. So, and I try to be consistent. Now we are like with my company, it's like uh, we have four people plus me. We are like production machine. So we produce two videos a week and we are quite good in production. So in this uh, high pace. In Singapore, I mean, this is home. So I'm not maybe as much excited about Singapore as I was first time when I I was going to Bali through Singapore in 2013, so I spent like three days in Singapore. I'm less excited about the place, but now it's home. Yeah. It feels like my my place. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't I don't have any other places. I not been to Russia for like almost five years, so I think even if I come to Russia, I don't feel that home. As, as it was before. So. Yeah, I understand, yeah. So you've, worked, so where you've built your family unit and you've got your yeah. career and... So my second daughter was born here. My first daughter, we, we arrived when she was just one year old. So basically, uh, that's my life here. So that's, yeah, that's yeah. the children only know Singapore is home. Yeah. And the children enjoy Singapore? They're still happy here? For the little one, I don't know yet. She's, she cannot talk yet, so <laughs> hopefully she enjoys. Silent agreement. When she, yeah, when she starts talking, maybe she's like, I hate it, I wanna go, I wanna go somewhere else. But for my older one, she's seven year old. Um, yeah, she, she likes Singapore a lot. Enjoying school, a great Enjoy education system here, so we're in for, a good place. For some reason, she, she's enjoying school. For me, it was not the case when yeah. I was, after the summer break, I was like, oh, I need to go to school again. 
but for her, like this, the school just started, and she was like super excited to go to school. I was like, huh? Are you, are you okay? Well, like, why are you? Why are you? Yeah, why yeah, why yeah, like yeah. a school so much? It's the same. You wonder why the kids <laughs> actually want to get back to school rather than enjoying the holidays for more. Yeah. Just going back to your childhood. What was your childhood like? Relatively happy, I would say. That's funny. We just because we just came from Phuket, so my daughter was. One day she uh, she played at the playground, and the playground was a little bit like imperfect. It's a bit dangerous, I would say. Even so, there is a it's a lot of fun, but let's say this the this the ground with the uh, you can roller skate there or, yeah. or, or or skate, and there are a lot of kids. No one watch them, no like guards or someone, uh, and they do opposite directions super fast. So it's pretty dangerous but a lot of fun and I was like oh that reminds me of my childhood yeah. so there were no like guards or securities or tutor or someone tell me like how not to get injured so it was my responsibility or my parents responsibility yeah. but no one else which I think adds to your character I think it does so it was my, my parents uh, my mom is she graduated as an uh, economist and she uh, she worked for like a few years and then when I, I was born she stopped working and my dad is a doctor he's a surgeon so he was always like a big inspiration for me mm -hmm. so he saved lives and he used to live in so many places like in Russia and in, in ex-USSR but yeah my childhood was like relatively okay we lived in uh, Vladivostok I grew up there from 2 to 14 year old it's the eastern part of Russia so it's close to Japan and Korea and China so it was back then in the 90s was huge influence of Japan and China actually so all the markets there were a lot of Chinese selling stuff in the markets and all the car 99% of the cars in the city were Japanese cars with the right right wheel right sided uh, yeah. cars compared to the rest of Russia that was only like that re eastern regions in Russia with but it's made much more sense to actually buy a used like Toyota the new Russian cars back then what did you study you studied in Russia or I started in Russia we actually moved to Volgograd it's more like a cent like more west part of Russia and I graduated as an engineer in a Volgograd State University not the top university this okay one but yeah so I spent five and a half years there and then I moved to Moscow by myself when I was 21, 22. And my parents and my sister, they stayed in, in Volgograd. And then I was like very happy to be free and like do whatever I want. Yeah, when you finish your education, cut the ties. So when you first left Russia, where did you go? Where was your first international experience as a, as I guess a graduate and someone on the search for a career? Um, surprisingly, my first one was the US. So I, I wasn't really well traveled before that first trip in the US when I was, I still lived in the Volgrad back then. So I was not 20 year old and it's, it's a kind of exchange, summer exchange program. Mm -hmm. So I went to US for three months and then the next summer again, US for three months. And it was mind blowing, like going to New York for the first time. It's like just what's going on? Like what kind of world is that? Like why so many crazy people <laughs> on the street? <laughs> Like why, what, why, what, 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 what's going on? That for me it was like shocking because I only lived pretty much in like Volgorod and Vladivostok back then. I was in Moscow for a couple of times, but New York is just mind blowing. So it was super interesting experience as a 20, 20 year old guy. Where did you move to after the US? And just take us through your travels through yeah. the different I start when I moved to Moscow. It was in the Germ this German company, Kerker. So I start going to Germany quite often, to Stuttgart area, south of Germany. Yeah, it was a lot of fun actually. It was exciting. Uh, it's like you're young, you have job, paid well, European company, and then you go to business trips to Germany. It was like yeah, pretty cool. And then I start exploring like country by country, Europe, pretty much. And then first time I moved out kind of permanently from Russia was when I was 23, 24, I went to, to UK, to London actually for a, for a year, uh, working there for the same company, for this Kerker German company. But then after a year in the UK, in London, I decided to go to return to Moscow 
because I saw like this, the company, the company was great. So I really liked the place, but I was a service engineer and I was the youngest in my team of service engineers. So I was 22, 23, 24, something like that. And my colleagues, they were at least 30 plus from 30 to 60. And some of them, they, they stayed in this like service engineering job for like 15 years, 20 years, 25 years. And I was like, okay, so what's my car potential career path if I stay there? And I'm a foreigner, I'm an immigrant there. So I probably will be the second choice because English is not, not my native language. And a second choice if they promote someone. So they probably promote first this 55 year old guy to uh, like senior uh, yeah. service engineer position. And then decided, okay. And in Moscow it was different vibe. It was like, economy was growing, was a lot of money in, in Moscow particularly. And all the, like, for example, my Kerker team in, in Russia was much younger than the German team and the UK team. And it was just much more fun. So I decided to go back to Moscow and stay there for a few years. And then, yeah, I spent like a few years in, in Moscow before meeting my wife, future wife, and so the next move was Singapore for in 2014 for mm -hmm. half a year. 2014, you spent your time here while your now wife got her MBA. Yeah. You were working. I started my project, so I That's did this blogging, projects. some online courses, yeah. some social media marketing services, this kind of stuff. And I was doing it like remotely for like Russian speaking audience. You mentioned earlier about keeping this exciting and con constantly yeah. changing to make sure people still want to watch your videos and want to read your content or obviously you're doing the, the training courses. So you've obviously kind of got a path mapped out of the way you want to take this and continue to mix it up and yeah. make it more interesting. <clears throat> uh, where do you see yourself in, let's go with five years in terms of your <laughs> current trajectory or your plan? For today's world, it's hard to say where the world will be in five years. But for me, I, I feel like I found the thing that I want to do for the next, like, I don't know, five, 10, 20 years. So basically interviewing people and meeting more interesting people like all over the world. Yeah. In Asia, particularly, maybe the next step will be more countries, not only Asian countries, but I feel like I'm on my place I kind of feel like I found myself and also because I did this here and there I did different things before some corporate career some business like was at his peak in 2020 then it kind of died out and I made a lot of mistakes but now I feel like when I'm building this project I feel like all my previous experience helped me a lot yeah. to not to make as many mistakes <clears throat> and actually to have the clear vision what I want to do I'm really actually I'm try to self-reflect what I really want to do and what brings me money. So meaning what, how I can contribute to the world, which transfers to money for me and my family and what I really want to do. I'm self-aware about it. And I feel like I found my, my thing, my job. So they weren't necessarily mistakes. They were learning opportunities you've had along the way that's got you to where you are. I guess, I think it's, it's important, and it's especially, I, I heard this quote in a movie recently saying, life is short, so you should never live the same day twice. Mm. And I guess it's a, it was a real kind of, it's been in the back of my mind for quite a while, because when you do live the same day twice and you become very aware of that fact, you kind of start to let the mundane sit in and mediocrity becomes your life. <laughs> yeah. You've obviously managed to figure out a way to, to plow through that by always evolving with what you're doing and taking mistakes and making them into opportunities. It's a bit tricky because I understand I need to do the same thing to get better. Yeah. Like, you know, like a Japanese approach. They, they could do like this pasta in the metro underground in Tokyo for like 80 years. Like one guy will be doing it and it's a perfection yeah. of this particular dish. So you need to be like consistent with what you're doing, meaning you kind of need to repeat your actions. Yeah. At the same time, I agree, you need to enjoy life and experience things. So it's kind of, you need to match it somewhere. And depends, I think depends on your personality. You match it either here or here or here, depends on you. And then we, it comes up to the question, how well you know yourself. And that's, yeah. the, that's the main thing to understand yourself. Your daughters or your seven year old um, has probably seen your face on YouTube every time YouTube's up. How, how does she, what does she think of daddy being on telly all the time? She asked me the same question like, oh daddy, how you make money? 
I know how mommy makes money, but like how you make money. So I actually tried to explain her <laughs> about this advertising model and stuff, why people pay, like why companies pay. But she's like, she's fine. She's not a big fan when I film her sometimes for like vlog type of video. Sometimes I, I want to film her, but she's not a big fan to be in front of the camera, but she's quite interested in what I'm doing. And she like asks questions and she's like, she knows that I get recognized on the streets by uh -huh. random people and she's quite like last time we just were walking around and like someone approached me say hi like so the, 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 some some viewer yeah I talked like quickly with the guy and he left and I I like ask her you seen it you seen the guy it's my, my view. <laughs> and she's like yeah yeah whatever because she <laughs> saw it already before and she's like yeah yeah I know I know daddy you're famous yeah yeah and have you do you think you've inspired her in any way to try and shape how she wants to see her I mean she's only seven but yeah you know, maybe she's to be, she's too small for now but later yeah I, I will try to to teach her so my goal is when she is maybe 14 15 to teach her how to make like thousand dollars online just to show her like few options few tools and then she decided if she want to do it maybe she had a gap gap year after her school and she because if you know how to make this one thousand dollars online you're pretty much safe you can live yeah, in yeah. Cambodia it'll help like you as well if you could teach her to make a thousand dollars it means you can make a thousand dollars less yeah, exactly yeah. so in terms of what, what do you I mean obviously once she goes through the phases of becoming an astronaut or a firefighter or all of these things that every child goes through yeah. what are your expectations or what do you what do you want from your two nearly two and seven-year-old what, what do you yeah. want from for their futures or what would you like to see not necessarily careers but just in terms of overall life goals yeah so one is seven one is one one sorry. year old yeah the second daughter i think i'm quite chilled that in terms of like i don't want to push her to be like someone you really need to do you need like to do this or you really need to become like a banker or like a lawyer or something i'll be happy if she become a happy person the thing is in terms of like let's say i don't know the skill set one is just i mentioned that i want her to understand how to make money online and then it depends on her if she want to use it or not and then languages so she's native in two languages russian and english and she's also like she she goes to bilingual program chinese english mm -hmm. program in the international school so hopefully by 12 by the end of primary school she can speak like good mandarin and then for me it's already it will be a big achievement huge, so like huge. two languages that she was born with english and russian and one like super hard language but extra language and like completely different language family so for the opportunities in life and for brain development, I think it's, it's huge. The rest, like for me, more important for now, maybe later it will change, but like soft skills. Yeah, like, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Her to be proactive. She's already like very proactive, so I'm happy that she is, it's natural for her, yeah. like like a leader and stuff. I try to teach her like a, like a normal stuff. So be kind, be proactive, be brave. This, the very, obvious things but to teach her and to show her yeah like maybe like do it by myself. example yeah well, what was your stepping stone into your YouTube I guess many years ago you started your Russian channel but prior to that what gave you the motivation or the background mm. training to be able to become successful where you are today I always wanted to do something like on my own I was always like entrepreneurial mindset I'm not the most successful entrepreneur for sure so I see people around me they are much more successful much more they they, they, they risk more the education is better they they know finance better and all other stuff but still I had this kind of artistic slash entrepreneurial mindset before so but I wasn't a corporate before starting the YouTube channel I was a brand manager for Gucci perfumery in Procter and Gamble back in Moscow, and before that I was an engineer in a in a Kercher. It's a German company, like clean equipment company. So and I graduated as an engineer. Mm -hmm. So from engineering I changed my career path to marketing slash business. It was already like big move, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, somehow I, I got accepted to my to Procter and Gamble. I'm not supposed to because like all of my colleagues. They were like from 
graduates from top unis in Russia. They were much smarter than me and like had proper marketing experience. Mm -hmm. For me, I was an engineer with a little bit of like a kind of engineer slash business side in my previous company. I wanted to do something more business uh, related. And I started searching for the companies that uh, hire people without the education in marketing, but I want to be in marketing. And it was literally like few companies like Procter Gamble, Unilever, Henkel, I think, these big FMCG companies. So I applied for roles in all of them and got accepted in PNG. And then, but after three years in PNG, I was like, oh, I still want something else. I still, I still want something on my own. And we decided with my girlfriend back then, our wife, we decided, okay, she was also in PNG. We decided, okay, she go for MBA. So that's how we ended up actually in Singapore first time. And we both quit. I will start my own project and she will start like her MBA. And that's how it was yeah, 10, 10 years ago, 2014. How do you make money through the channel and just to overall <clears throat> make a career and a, a healthy income through YouTube? There are few income streams uh, right now from the channel. One is the YouTube monetization. So it comes from YouTube itself. Like it's called Google AdSense. Mm -hmm. So basically, YouTube show the advertising in your videos and then pay you, as we discussed, pay you half. So it's just roughly like 5,000 USD every month. So it's a five to six K USD every month. So I get a paycheck from Google every month. Nice. Basically. That's, well, that's one. Based on number of views or is that just, I'm based assuming? On, yeah, based on number of views and based on... Clicks and... Uh, geographic uh, okay. and based on the topics. So let's say the highest one would be a lot of views plus American audience or UK audience. And the topic is about finance or investments or like crypto. So it's all kind of categorized and yeah. so it's in, it's in your best interest to get a broader audience globally rather than just having millions of people in a single location. I would put it this way. It's not the main driver for me like to choose or oh, I only want to do like investment advice for Americans because yeah. I have no idea about it and I don't want to create this content. I know that let's say my some videos get more views but the CPM so it is the how much YouTube pays me will be lower and it's okay so I try to be try to have the healthy approach towards towards it. So I kind of the first priority is the topics and the guests that I want and the second priority okay is how much money will be paid by YouTube for this particular category. So That's diversification of content, broader <laughs> audience reach, all those things that yeah. contribute to you building up to the AdSense. And then other than AdSense, there are additional streams. Uh, yeah, second stream is brand deals. That's the biggest stream right now. So it ranges from the highest brand deal that we had so far was 18K USD, 18,000 nice. for one one minute insert in a video yeah but it's like a more like outlaw so not it depends on the the, the scope of works that we yeah. do for the company depends on also the the product we already had like few really well-known brands like Revolut we did this for Revolut we did this for better help the average let's say so we had this 18k recently we had 9k recently but the average like five, six K USD for a brand deal. And it also depends on the geographic. Let's say some companies want Singapore audience, so we can give them Singapore audience through the Singapore mm -hmm. interviews. Some companies want like Indian audience. There are a lot of like variations, but this is the biggest the income stream right yeah. now at the moment. The third one is affiliate deals. So we have some partner companies that we promote and then we bring them leads and customers mm -hmm. and they pay us a commission from the customer from what customer pays us and it's normally like win-win for the audience because we do some let's say we give to the, our audience some special deal that we agree with the with the brand let's say they have 10 percent off yeah the product and then we get our commission but the audience also get this 10 percent off like the special deal if they go through our affiliate links. 
That's the third one. And the fourth one is the, the course, the, the YouTube program, Side yep. Hustle, YouTube Mastery. So the biggest launch so far we did was 30K USD, 30,000 USD was our first launch. Nice. Yeah, and then we launch like a few times a year. We do like a big launch. And then you also can buy it between the launches, but with a bit higher price. Your training course. So I myself have signed up for that. So maybe this could become a thing I'll be doing more often. Yeah. Um, but just to tell us how that uh, was conceptualized and what you know, you've obviously put a lot of work into your own training and now you're going to impart that training on others. Talk to me a bit more about where you want to take that training and what your ultimate goal is going to be for it. There are a few things in life that I really, that I can like talk about for hours. One is YouTube, basically. So I love everything about YouTube, the algorithm, the content creation parts, like how to get the views, how to monetize it. That's what I talk about with the community. I'm part of my, my team, my wife, my friends. So basically it's naturally, it's super interesting uh, for me. And I'm quite experienced in seeing different channels to grow yeah. on, on YouTube. And because we had a course, we have this program in Russian before, it was relatively successful in Russian. So I decided to create it in, in English, for basically for my audience in, in English, like for this YouTube channel. So you told me earlier, and this blew my mind, over 100 million views of your, your videos. It obviously takes Total, a while yeah. to start to build that up. Um, and I'm assuming it's exponential over time, starting from very few yeah. up to where you are, uh, where you are today. You've basically built your own career, um, which has been successful based around this. Um, what would your advice be to someone that wants to start on this path, <coughs> other than be patient, be patient, and be yeah. persistent? Uh, and what you, what you mentioned earlier, what's your number one piece of advice for someone that wants to get into this game? Do it faster. Don't overthink it, because. The super important thing is the, the concept of your channel and literally the topic, the theme of your content. The topic plus your angle and your ang angle will be different from other YouTube channels. It will yeah. be like individual based on you. And it's hard to predict what will it be, especially if you don't have the experience before with YouTube. So it doesn't make sense to overthink. You need to like, okay, I want to try this. I want to test this. Let's say this topic, then just go for it. And then in the beginning, it's the game of quantity, not quality. Yeah. So you need to create like 10, 20, 30 videos and then see, okay, do I like it or not? How the audience reacts on it? Do I have any spikes in, in views in some of the videos? And if yes, why? Mm -hmm. What was so special about this video or this topic? So, but you need to start faster to start like testing mode. Otherwise, like the most uh, people make, make these mistakes, they overthink it. So they think too much about it and they never start. Or yes. if they start, they post one video and then it's already so much, they think it was so much effort because well, they were thinking for, too much into for months. Yeah. And then so one video they posted and then 50 views. And they're like, what the hell? Why, yeah, why yeah, am yeah. I even doing this? Disheartened. Yeah. yeah, overthinking is a habit I'm very guilty of. I think you made a good point. I think and there's a lot of people that overthink tend to be perfectionists as well. So they aim for perfect and that day never comes because you keep overthinking perfect and perfect keeps on sliding on the scale. So quantity, try it out, keep an eye on your market, see which ones are successful. Yeah. Um, keep an eye on which videos are successful and which ones aren't. And you can start with, I mean, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube which is pretty, someone just running around with a mobile phone doing stuff, right? So it doesn't need to be perfect. You can still start to- No, no, basically point. you need a phone, um, clip mic, like this one. You can buy a cheaper one for like 15 bucks. And the daylight, the that's daylight. it. <laughs> yeah. For the start, it's, it's more than enough. Yeah. We have this, uh, the workshop, I don't, you, you also, you went I to did. this workshop, yeah? I did That's join it. the workshop and you uh, you convinced me to sign up the very same day. So uh, yeah. the other <laughs> thing I suffer with, and I think this may, be, uh, this may resonate with other people that are thinking is imposter syndrome, Yeah. Um, which is kind of ironic that I'm sitting here interviewing you talking about <laughs> imposter syndrome. But it is something that a lot of people might go through when they're yeah. starting out on something brand new, you know, who am I to be doing this or why should I be doing this? What, what's your advice for people that not only overthink, but suffer from imposter syndrome when they start out. Imposter syndrome is very natural and it's scientifically proved that 
most of people have it. Just because when you, let's say you start learning finance or investments, and then let's say in a few months, you're like, okay, I understand. I understand how to do it. I understand the, the, the tools and stuff. But then if you go deeper after like one or two years, it's like, oh shit, I don't understand much about it because you go deeper, deeper, deeper. And that's the natural thing for, for anything, basically. I used to do a lot of like public speaking before, especially in Russian and about personal branding, about social media. And when you're on stage speaking, that's the setup when everybody is supposed to listen to you because you're on stage, just, just because of that, because of this, this setup, physical setup. But it doesn't mean that there are no people in the audience who are smarter than you, who are richer than you, yeah. who are cooler than you. It's just the setup. These 100 people, they are in the audience, they are listeners now, and you're on the stage. So because of that. So when you start filming yourself, you get like take this camera in, in, in your hand. You are in a position of a YouTuber or Instagrammer or content creator, influencer. It's just because, because of that, you already like took this step forward compared to others. Yeah, yeah. People are naturally, they're more, more supportive than you think. And also, if it's only people that you know will watch your channel in the beginning, normally people tend not to tell you like directly that you're doing <laughs> shit or like why, why you stop. St so people, normally people more gentle. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. if people are super negative around you, probably something, something wrong really wrong with your social circle if people yeah. start like yeah, shitting yeah. on you just because you started something new i like to play this game with the with the haters sometimes i just apologize in the comments they say oh like you are like you're saying bullshit and i'm like <laughs> oh sorry i didn't mean it so i was actually yeah maybe i made a mistake and you know what they a lot of cases they reply oh sorry sorry i didn't mean it you know it's one of the ill effects <laughs> of social media unfortunately people just some people very yeah. few people feel the need to, uh, to trash you thinking they're going to get a reaction. Yeah. It's funny how other people step in to defend you as well. So at the workshop you will discover your niche along with its profit potential. You will know the fastest way to get your first thousand subscribers. Then I'll teach you how to overcome your fears and create your first video. And you'll receive a roadmap to create your side project on YouTube and generate passive income from it. So consider joining me at the workshop, link to sign up in the description. What are your thoughts on where social media is taking humankind and where it's going to be when your children grow up and how it kind of shapes some of their thoughts and insecurities even or, or securities? Yeah. What are your thoughts on social media for your children? Generally, I'm against the, this very easy to consume short form content, this vertical one. We also make this content out of long videos. We create the short videos, but I'm not a big fan of them because I think it's like super addictive it's even yeah. even me i spent doom like, scrolling I think they call yeah it. yeah and that's the addiction like alcohol addiction or drugs addiction it, that, that's the addiction it's the dopamine 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 rush, hit yeah. like super easy one it's because horrible. your phone is like just next to you so i think it needs to be controlled somehow by parents or by school or by government all, all together it, yeah. there need to be control in it that's the negative part the positive part i feel like everything is a content creation basically you make a presentation for your boss or for your team that's the content creation you need to be able to work with the content and to to be able to rewrite or reform it reshape it reuse mm -hmm. it so basically if you know how to do it you can start a youtube channel or vice versa if you know how to YouTube works or Instagram works is basically give you the skill of like working with the content. So I'm not super negative about wh where we as a humanity are going with the social media. It's more like a, I think the AI is the big thing. We don't understand shit about it. What's going to be with the world in five mm. years and 10 years with AI. So I think the threats are more like AI plus politics. That's more dangerous than yeah. the social media. AI is exciting though. I mean, AI has got the positives. I work in the healthcare industry where AI is going to be hugely exciting over the coming years. Oh yeah. Um, but then again, it's going to be, it's going to be utter trash for politics where stuff can be manipulated or, so there's, there's pros and cons like there is for everything. I mean, some of, if you can separate the good content from the bad content, then it would be a good place to be. I've seen some great YouTube shorts that teach you how to do things. Oh, that's brilliant. 
but then you just see someone with 20 million views because they've slapped someone around the back of the head and ran away. That sort of garbage just needs to be somehow deleted. That's actually what Chinese government does with their TikTok, because their TikTok is, is not TikTok in the rest of the world. It's the separated TikTok. Right. And so basically they push for more content. I mean, they, of course, they can control it. It's not, it doesn't work in democratic countries. You cannot control as much as China can do. But they actually push for more educational content mm. in TikTok. Which is great. Which, which is great. Yeah. Hey, what's your favorite music? Oh, my favorite music, a grunge, I would say. Grunge? I used to listen to a lot of grunge. Nirvana was my favorite band when I was 16. Very cool. Yeah. Good. <laughs> rock and roll? Any rock and roll? Any older yeah. music? Like, I'm pretty versatile, like diverse with the, my taste of, for, for music. So I can listen to basically anything like pop music, like rap music. Do you enjoy grunge? I used to, I not, not so much anymore. I was a, at a Metallica concert like a few years ago and Metallica was like a big for me when I was younger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then the concert was like, I enjoyed it a lot. I was like 20 meters away from, from the stage. But it was not like, not so much wow as if I went to the concert when I was in my 20s or something. And when they were still in their 20s, yeah. rather than being in their 70s. <laughs> exactly, yeah, 80s. <laughs> Good. Okay, favorite food? Oh, I mean, we're in Singapore, so... <laughs> Laksa, one of my favorite ones. Yeah. So many, actually. I enjoy like a lot of Indian food and Russian food as well. and like. Chinese, uh, yeah, it's just everything. A, then, uh, yeah, yeah, it's just a lot. It's quite and handy. The the funny thing is, <laughs> we we went to Phuket recently, and there are a lot of like Russians and Russian restaurants as well, mm -hmm. Russian cuisine. And I used to love my home country food, but now it tastes a little bit like pale, not spicy enough because Russian yeah. food is not spicy, and now something is missing. What's the best advice anyone's ever given you in your life? One advice I got from my ex-boss in my first company in Kerher, he said, you will meet people twice in your life. Meaning that even if you like break up with, I don't know, your life partner or with your business partner or with your friends, try not to be harsh and try to s still like keep your relationships. Yeah. Not on a like, try to end it not on a super negative note because the life, the world is small. It is. And you will, there is a high chance you will meet this person again through something else in your life. Yeah. So what's the meaning of life to you? For me, it's, it's that's the, that's not the eventual goal, but that's the way. So the process, the process of improving something or developing something. It's even like for this, for, for the YouTube, YouTube videos, I'm super happy when I see the final product. I see it's, it's good. I like it. It's just a nicely done video with someone like really interesting person. So I enjoy the journey. So I think for me, enjoying the journey, it's like, let's put it this way. For example, my, my kids, there is for me, there is no like obvious reason to have kids because you spend so much money for them. You much less free with if you have kids. So 10 times more stressful. 10 times more stressful and... Keep you up at night. Actually, don't get me started on that because I'll yeah, yeah. blow <laughs> the mean, video up. You understand. Yeah. Um, but having a kid and seeing your kids are growing and becoming hopefully better, are just developing, physically yeah. developing, yeah, growing. Yeah. Yeah. It's just amazing. And that's the same for business or for YouTube. See something like growing. That's, for me, that's kind of the meaning of, of life. And if I can play a role in the growth of like my kids, my, my company, my YouTube channel, I'm, I'll be the happiest person. Yeah. yeah. It's the journey, I like that. Yeah. There's no meaning, there's a journey. It's a journey towards the meaning. Yeah, because for me, I'm not religious. Uh, and I'm quite skeptical about why the whole, why this exists, why we exist. It's like, I think there is no, point in most of the cases when something happens like some bad things happen with your like relatives people psychologically they need to you need to explain themselves that there was a reason so someone was hit by a car or some terrible thing happened but sometimes there is just no reason that's the coincidence yeah wrong place wrong time yeah and so for me the meaning is not like everything has its meaning that's not my concept of how I see the world. But how I see the world, if I see something is growing or changing to a better state, that's for me kind of the reason. 
why, yeah. why, why, why yeah, it's all yeah. happening.